This is the Bethany Bible Church channel. I'm Pastor Ron Vandermeer with a special message for you today from 1 Samuel 17. Our title, It is Time to Plan to Succeed. The story there, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with that, is the story of David and Goliath. So let's go back in time to that valley that lay between the forces of Israel and their enemies, the Philistines. The enemy had a giant warrior. Israel had only one 18-year-old teenager who believed that God was more powerful than any giant. David had five smooth stones that he had chosen, one for Goliath and one for each of his four brothers. David was confident. Sure, he was doing what God wanted him to do. His attitude and his preparation for the battle provides an example for each of us, and we're going to discuss this today. Let's pray. Father God, we come humbly into your presence, seeking your guidance and direction today as we open your word. And Lord, let us remember, we are your children, no matter what our age. And there is so much that we need to learn about how to live and grow in our relationship with you and our trust in you, our Father, which art in heaven. And we ask this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Our first thought is that we need to set our goals and live by faith. How many of you times have you wanted to achieve a goal but felt unsure or afraid? Maybe the challenge seemed too great, or you thought you lacked the ability, education, or the money to achieve it. As a young man, David no doubt had some of these same questions. He probably wondered how life would turn out for him. While tending his father's sheep, David had plenty of time to develop a personal relationship with God. And this is where David gained his greatest victory. God took years to prepare him for the role he would one day assume as Israel's greatest king. During that time, David never lost sight of the priorities that the Lord had given him as a youth. The day he faced Goliath, Every principle that God had taught him came together in one defining moment. We want to see in 1 Samuel 16, if we wanted to read that entire chapter, we see that David uh, had developed these principles as a child. And then as we come to chapter 17, David, who was trained to believe that with God's help and by faith, he would succeed, and he would hit his target. And in one swift, quick motion, David achieved his goal, which speaks to the fact that we need to also set goals even when we face an obstacle that seems overwhelming. The army of Israel, and even the king named Saul, faced the obstacle of Goliath with fear. That's stated very plainly in 1 Samuel 17, verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard these words, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. When David arrived on the scene in the midst, midst of this dismay, uh, not everyone was happy to see him. His own brothers were very unhappy, as it says in verse 28. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Talk about uh, being put down. David was put down in front of all those who were there when he said, isn't there a cause for fighting Goliath? You see, opposition is almost always a certainty 
when you really understand who God is and others do not, and especially when you trust him to do the impossible, David had to go around the obstacle of his brothers to reach the real obstacle, which was Goliath. And he did both in the strength of the Lord. You see, setting goals and priorities that are according to God's standards will bring God's blessing and victory. In verse 26, it says this in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? We read then in verses 36 and 37, your servant, he's talking to Saul at this point, your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. You know, we don't often announce our... Uh, goals to the actual enemy, but even we find that in verses 46 to 47, David tells uh, Goliath exactly what he's going to do. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you, and this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Those verses show that David had a priority, and that was to defend the Lord's reputation. As we said a week ago, we're here to glorify God. And that's exactly what David was doing. He was bringing all glory to God. He was standing up for the name of God, which was being despised and cursed that very day. David was not concerned about having a big home, a storehouse of treasures, or even being king at that point, for which he had always been an, already been anointed by Samuel. His objective was to honor God. And that's the difference between his success and the failure of King Saul. Well, we have another thought, and this will have several elements to it. And that is that God has a plan for setting goals. And the Lord's plans are awesome, far beyond what we can imagine and always overflowing with blessing and hope. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. You see, when we tap into his purposes for our lives, we not only learn how to set godly priorities, we also gain the power to realize these purposes, which bring us a sense of true fulfillment and joy. All right, let's start. The first one, clarity of purpose. David had a clear mental picture of what to accomplish. As long as you allow fear and thoughts of inadequacy to send shockwaves through your heart, you will never achieve your goals. The moment you begin to trust God for the victory and realize it's his strength, not yours, that is going to propel you forward, you will see a change in your own attitude. You see, faith is right there. And for David, it was faith in a sovereign God who loves you unconditionally, and that's going to bring the hope and the assurance of success. You'll be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We have a consuming desire 
2, and that's our second thought, David had a passion to please and honor the Lord, which was essential for reaching any goal, no matter how large it may be. Psalm 122, 1 shows David's passion for being in God's house in these words, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Do you have a consuming desire to worship God, to be in his presence, to sit there in church waiting, anticipating, learning more about God and his word? David had that, and it was a consuming desire. Third, we want to see that David had confidence. David's confidence was not in his abilities or even in his own past experiences. He was a child, basically, had just turned 18, most likely, but rather in the power of God. Paul had a great resume. Taught, He was taught by the greatest scholar of the day, chosen by Christ to bring the gospel to the Gentile world. Yet in Philippians 3, 8, and 9, he says, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and be found in him. That's confidence. Paul had it and David had it as we see in this account. Next, we need a course of action. David had a plan of action, but his objectives involved a surrender to God in every area of his life. That is always key. You need to surrender everything, everything, or you'll never experience the true and total success that God wants you to have. Your course of action will become clear as you draw closer to God through the study of his word. That's why I pray that each of you will commit to following a Bible reading guide each day. Every day you need to read the word of God and you need to approach it with anticipation of what you will learn that day in reading his word and meditating upon it and then praying for God to work in your life. It says in Romans 6, 12 to 14, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. You see, David basked in his salvation from the Lord, and it caused him to shun sin and to not obey that. He wasn't under law. He was under grace already. He truly understood in his private devotions with God out there while he was tending the sheep. God instructed him and he told him about grace. We live also under grace and we need to act like we live under grace. And we need to have a course of action because we're in a battle with the, the world system we're in a battle with Satan. The world, the flesh, and the devil are out there. And we have the almighty God to direct us. And we will bring the victory when we do that, when we allow God to lead and don't let sin have dominion in our lives. We have a calendar of events. That's our next thought that we get from this. David's goals were so easily measurable. We should mark our progress also by milestones on a calendar, some sort of uh, 
statement or maybe even a diary that you have that uh, you can uh, uh, refer to and set deadlines for goals in your life, in your spiritual life as well as all aspects of your life. The last thing Satan wants for you to do is to go regularly to church. He wants you to be a CEO, Christmas and Easter only. No, that's, that's what everybody can do that. You go every week to church. And the last thing Satan wants you to do when you do go is to show that you really trust God by giving some of your hard-earned money to the cause of Christ. Oh, that makes Satan shudder because that means that you're really understanding that everything you have belongs to him because he gives you the strength to earn that money. And so, as Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Is it with God? God knows our thoughts, and God has desires for us, goals and dreams for us that we can find out as we get closer to him. Jeremiah 29, 11 is a favorite verse of many people. It says there, I know the thoughts I think of you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. You see, we don't cower thinking about God in fear. No, God loves us. He wants to give us a future. He wants to give us hope that we can get through all the obstacles in this life. He did it for David. He can do it for you today. You need to be available for him. Consistency. That's the next one. David was taunted, even by his own brothers, we read earlier, and yet he remained consistent. He didn't quit. He didn't go back home and tell his father, my brothers are mean to me. I was just asking questions. No, he stayed. He kept going. He realized that God had a job for him to do. If you quit your goals, the thought of failure will become etched in your memory. Oh, discouragement is one of Satan's best tools. He uses it all the time. I often say to people who have had a tremendous fall in the uh, spiritual or moral area, God doesn't want you to stay on the shelf. Yes. Okay, you've put yourself there. You're in time out. God doesn't want you to stay there. He wants you to get back up, repent of what has gone on, not feel sorry for yourself or blame everybody for your failures. God wants you to be honest, but get back up, get back into the goals that God has for you. He doesn't want anybody on the side. Why do you think he ne sat next to Judas? At the Last Supper, why would you pick the guy who is, a, you already know, is the, the enemy sitting at your table? It's to give him another chance. But Judas did not take it. And none of us are in his category. So whatever you've done, don't let that put you out of where God wants you to be. Yes, you repent. You're sorrowful. You talk to those that you have injured and, and ask for their forgiveness. And you ask God, of course, for his forgiveness. And you get back up. And you get back in to what God wants you to do. You see, God wants to be involved in everything. And we honor God. It's so key. We need to control our emotions. David did that. He said, my heart is steadfast Oh God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. That's Psalm 57, 7. And lastly, we need the courage to act. David told Saul, Let no man's heart fail on account of Goliath. Your servant 
will go and fight with the Philistine. David knew that God would win the victory. You see, God always knows what lies ahead, and thus we must trust him. Do you trust him? Do you have a dependence upon God? Great victories will come when you exalt and honor God with your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the example of David, that he trusted you completely, and that he had a plan that he knew was from you because he meditated and prayed to you and thought about the Word of God and read the Word of God that he had, and he lived by the promises that are in the Word of God. Oh, help us today, Lord, to be like David and to follow your Word. And in that way, we will succeed. Our plans, which are from you, will come true. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings to us each and every day. And now strengthen us to truly look for your purpose, your goals, and make them ours in our lives. For you love us and you are there to guide and direct and give us hope. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. We hope you've enjoyed our weekly broadcast. Consider writing to us or making a donation through Zelle with the email below. If you are in the Los Angeles area, join us each Sunday for services at 11 a.m. or 6 p.m. Bethany Bible Church Channel is a ministry of Bethany Bible Church in Glendale, California.